this is Joe from What I'm Playing Now, and we are back with another stream today. Uh, today we're actually going to be streaming through House of Danger from Z-Man Games. This is a choose-your-own-adventure style game. And let's switch over to the board so you can kind of see kind of what's going on here. So one of the first choose your own adventure games that I actually played back in the day, I guess let me go back to my other screen real quick, um, was in a book form. Um, this is uh, The Cave of Time. This was by Edward Packard. This is probably from the late 70s to um, early 80s. And this is essentially just a book where you start reading it, and at the bottom of each page, uh, there's a decision that you're going to try to make. And based on that decision, it will tell you to go to a different page. And that's kind of what Z-Man Games has kind of replicated here and redone, but kind of in a board game fashion. So as the titles for this game state, there will be spoilers ahead. There's pretty much no way I can do this without doing spoilers. So we're going to play through the first chapter. Um, maybe the second chapter, we'll see how long the first chapter takes us. They say to usually do a chapter in a setting. So we're going to give that a go. So one of the first things you're supposed to do is on the back of the actual board, there is a picture, which is kind of like a dream. Supposedly the object of the game is what it says here, and I'm just going to read this verbatim through from the rule book, is that you're an aspiring a detective and psychic investigator. For weeks you have experienced recurring nightmares that you sense might be important. Your mission is to get to the bottom of these visions. You will decide how to move through the story as a group. The story is divided into five chapters, each of which will be played as a single session. So like I said, we're going to play through chapter one. I've already looked at the picture. You're supposed to look at this picture for a couple of minutes. Um, hopefully I can remember some of the things that are on here. And then you pretty much set up the board. Um, you're going to put, I believe, the cube here. This goes here. Let's see. Yep. Actually, you know what? I got those reversed. The cube goes here, and this goes here on your level. And then you pretty much are just going to be reading through the scenario, and you're going to pretty much just try to get to the end goal. Um, there are some items that we actually have that we start off with. We have a, a pocket knife which actually allows us to get a boost. And I got the rule book over here because there's only a couple of pages to the rule book, but there really isn't much to it, um, which allows me to get a plus one in fighting. So whenever I have to do a challenge, I'm going to look at what my danger meter is. Wherever my cube is at on the danger meter, I have to roll that number or higher. Um, if the challenge that I'm doing, let's say there's a fighting symbol on here, is a fighting um, challenge, I can utilize my pocket knife. I would move the card over to the challenge booster booster area. I would roll my die, see if I passed. With a plus one, I actually would, being where I'm at, at the three right now. And I would then succeed in the challenge, and then we would go to the next page in the story. This is our story deck. This is our clue deck over here. After you use an item, it goes back into your inventory. The other item that we actually have is a bottle of water. Uh, this one, it's keep this item discard at any time to lower the danger meter by three. So this one actually would get discarded into the discard pile for the clues and it would lower my challenge meter, which is right here by um, three. This along the outer track is your psychic scale. Um, there are multiple levels on here. You're starting off at level one, level two, level three, level four, level five. So as you're playing through the adventure, you're kind of going to be leveling yourself up um, and I believe you're going to get maybe a little stronger and, and be able to do a couple more things, I believe, as the game goes through. If this challenge meter ever does get to the top or go past it, um, you do lose two of your psychic level. And then this goes back down to, follow this arrow, right back down to that three right there. At the beginning of the game, though, you're going to start down there on the bottom. So that's about the gist of how this is played. There's going to be quite a bit of reading um, that I'm going to be doing for this. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. So when you start this game, you're supposed to take the first card and then keep this card that's on top of the story deck kind of covered up so you're not really seeing what's ahead of you. 
and then we start reading. So it says the grounds, chapter one. It's a Tuesday morning in late June and you wake up in a cold sweat. The nightmares came again last night. Even though you are an aspiring detective and psychic, psychic investigator, you haven't been able to make sense of the haunting dreams you've had these past few weeks. In your dreams, you keep seeing the same spooky house. You're still shivering under the covers when you hear the phone ring downstairs in your basement, where you have your combination office and research laboratory. You dash down to the lab to answer it. I need, I need, a weak voice says, and you pick up the receiver. I need your help or when you pick up the receiver, I need your help. You hear a loud click and the phone goes dead. But you were prepared. While the caller was talking, you activated your high-speed telephone tracing device. It instantly displays the caller's number, 555-7259. You call back the number right away, but there's no answer. After consulting the tall stack of reverse phone books behind your desk, you are disappointed to learn the number is unlisted. You sense that the phone is somehow related to your nightmares, Later, while at the Hedgebrook police station to return a night scope you borrowed for a recent stakeout, you describe the mysterious phone call and the story is continued on the next page. So we're going to go ahead and discard that and then pull the next one. Describe the mysterious phone call and your recurring dreams to your friend, Sergeant Morrison. That call does sound strange, he says. We'll look into it. And about that house in your dreams, a voice says from the hallway, I wonder if you're dreaming about the Marsden house out on Hedgebrook Road. Detective Murphy sticks his mustache face into the room. Modern house, ornate gate? That sounds like the Marsden place, all right, says Sergeant Morrison. Strange things are reported to happen out there. Detective Murphy takes a puff on his pipe. That place is haunted, he says. I know it sounds unprofessional, but I've had a file on the Marsden house for years, and I'm sure of it. He waves a folder in front of your eyes, and a phone number written on the front jumps at you. It matches the one from your mysterious phone call. So the call is related to your nightmares. Your psychic sense were right. Draw clue 26 to discover your goal. So we're going to take our clue pile here. We're going to look for clue 26, which is close to the end here. Our goal, chapter one goal, get inside the Marsden house. Place this card in the goal slot above the psychic scale while playing this chapter. So this card is going to go right above the goal slot. And that is our goal for this first chapter. Back at home, you grab a bottle of water and our trusty pocket knife. Preparing for a new investigation, half an hour later, you stand before the Marsden residence which appears exactly as it did in your nightmares. The house's futuristic look is a strange contrast to the antiquated appearance of the stone wall and the wrought iron gate, which is locked, shut, and wrapped in steel chains. Even though the air is balmy, a chill travels down your spine. The gathering clouds on the horizon hint at a brewing summer thunderstorm. So now we have a choice of a couple of different things. So this is where the game kind of gets interesting. So if you search the wall for a way in, I go to story card 13. If I climb the gate, I go to story card 7. I think we're just going to kind of maybe do it easy, and we'll see how easy this is and see if we end up hurting ourselves climbing this gate. But I think we're going to climb the gate. Um, so we're going to go ahead and discard this story card, and then we're going to go to story card 7. So I look for story card 7. And we'll see what climbing the gate actually gives us. Pull yourself over the rusting gate and land with a crunch on the gravel driveway leading toward the house. But before you can survey your surroundings, you hear a guttural sound coming from your left. You encounter a shadowy, hunched over figure emerging from the darkened doorway of a decrepit gatehouse. You can just barely make out the eyes and white fangs dripping with saliva. Maybe we should have looked for the door. This doesn't sound good. The figure crouches as if to spring forward at any moment. Who's there? You stammer. Suddenly, the creature lunges at you, snarling. You spot a guardhouse not far away. If you can get past the creature, you might be able to hide there. 
or perhaps you should just turn and flee up the driveway toward the main house. So right now we have an optional fight challenge. So we can actually fight the creature. If we win, we draw clue 10. If we lose, the danger raises by two. Um, we have our knife with us. We're at three right now. I'm thinking let's maybe try to get into a little fight here. So we're gonna go ahead and do a fight. So we're gonna go ahead and actually utilize the pocket knife. It's gonna give us a plus one since we're actually doing a fight combat right now. So I need to roll a two or higher. I roll a five plus one is six. So we actually win the fight. I do get to keep this item. So this basically just goes back into my inventory, which is kind of like on either side of that challenge booster marker there. And we get to draw clue 10. So we're gonna go through the deck here. We're gonna find clue 10. Not try to peek at any of the other cards. I'm gonna try to pull up Twitch real quick while this is actually going and make sure the audio sounds good. So hopefully the audio is sounding good on this. Yep. And it sounds like it is. Okay. All I wanted to make sure was that the audio sounded good and make sure that audio was working. So clue 10. It's probably unwise to engage such a savage beast in combat, but danger is your middle name. You land a few quick jabs on the creature before it can react, and then you throw it to the ground. You stand there for a moment, your confidence high. Then the creature leaps to its feet and rushes you. You manage to win round one, but you're in no hurry to start round two. So you race for the shadows beside a big boulder before the creature can get its hands on you. Draw clue 25. So this clue is just going to get um, discarded. So let me make a little room for a discard pile of clues. We're gonna put those kind of face up so we know that that's actually been read. And we're going to go for clue 25. So it seems like I'm gonna be kind of bouncing back and forth between um, the two decks we have here based on what's going on. Um, I find a pair of binoculars in the shadows. With the creature on the loose, you can't hide here forever, so you run to the guardhouse. Keep this item, go to story card 19. So actually, if I would have run to the guardhouse, I would have gotten to go to story card 19. But because I actually fought and ended up in the shadows and found these binoculars, that's actually going to give me a plus two to some perception rolls um, because there's a little eyeball figure on here. So we're going to go ahead and set this down here in our inventory as well. And I'm, you know what? I'm going to have to probably move the box out of the way um, so I have room for um, more inventory cards as we start getting more inventory. So we get to go to story card 19. We're going to go ahead and discard this card here and look for 19. There's 18 and here is 19. So there's, as you can see, there's multiple ways you can go in this game and there's a lot of things that can happen. Um, one thing that I will say and what it said in the rules is death is not the final part of the game. Um, if you do die, it actually tells you, um, you kind of like, I think, lose a psychic level or something. I'll have to look up and actually see what happens. But you lose like a psychic level or two um, and kind of reset and then you get to go back to the previous card and choose again. Uh, so so death in this game isn't isn't the end all of the game. So it's not like you're going to you know, be playing the game for like a half hour, 45 minutes, get to a card, die, and then have to go through the whole thing all over again. Um, it's a little more forgiving than that, it sounds like. Um, but let's see now that we're making a dash uh, to the guardhouse. So you were lucky to escape the creature, but you know it's still out there somewhere. You run into the old guardhouse, which is a small room with several TV monitors flashing black and white images of various places on the estate ground. Some monitors are broken and shards of glass are scattered across a desk and the wood floors. A hefty book titled History of Northwind County is lying on the desk. 
Curious, you look up the name Marsden Henry in the index. Sure enough, it references an entry on page 93. Your heart races as you turn to read this bio. Henry Marsden, born 1839, died 1887. General in the Union Army during the Civil War, severely wounded at the Battle of Shiloh in 1862. Appointed warden of Hedge Brook Prison in 1880 rumored to have been killed in the prison riot fire of 1887. Not a popular guy, you think. The desk has three drawers. Maybe there's something useful inside. A wooden ladder leads up to a hatch in the roof through a window filled with cobwebs. You can see an open field that leads to the manor's front door. You consider what to do next. Since I'm actually doing a stream out to Facebook, I'm gonna go ahead and actually kind of retweet this over to my um, page. So give me one second to do that. I probably should have done that a few minutes ago. Let's actually share this. Live playthrough of House of Danger. All right, so as we said, through a window filled with cobwebs, you can see an open field that leads to the manor's front door. You consider what to do next. So we have an optional challenge here. So when you do come up to an optional challenge, you can either try to attempt the roll or not. Um, since I have the binoculars right now, I'm actually going to be doing what's referred to as a perception check, um, which I can probably show you over here on this screen. So I'm doing a perception check. That little eyeball there is the perception symbol. So now if I do fail this, I do raise the danger meter by one, which I'd still be in the three area, so I think I'll be fine there. And I need to roll a four, but if I utilize my handy dandy high power binoculars, I get a plus two to my perception roll. So I only need to roll a two or higher to actually succeed at this. So we're going to go ahead and try to take the roll. We rolled a six. And so that's an eight. So we definitely crush that one. Um, and when we do that, we draw clue four. So we're going to grab the clue deck here. Grab clue number four. and see what we got. We found a battery. You find a battery in a drawer. It could power a flashlight or a taser or who knows what else. Keep this item, finish story card 19. All right, so we're gonna put this also in our inventory. The binoculars are gonna come back out. Um, we're gonna put our battery over here. Um, luckily we have, I left enough room here for us to have a nice large inventory of space since we moved the box there. But we need to continue along with card 19. After challenge, make story choice below. So I did the challenge. Like I said, the challenge was optional. We didn't have to, but I think not doing some of the challenges, especially when they're optional, I think you might miss out on finding some resources that are probably going to help you along later on in the story is my guess. So. I have the choice. If I climb the ladder into the hatch, or if I climb the ladder to the hatch in the roof, I go to story card 27. If I crawl through the window and run for the front door of the house, go to story card three. So we know the creature is still out there. I think crawling through the window and running for the front door of the house is probably not gonna be the smartest thing to do. I think we're gonna climb the ladder and go to the roof. So we're gonna discard this card and that tells us to go to card 27. So we basically look here and grab card 27 and see where that takes us. You scramble up the ladder through the hatch and onto the guardhouse's decaying tile roof. It seems to be on the verge of collapsing, but you find a spot that you are reasonably sure won't cave in when you put your weight on it. Well, thank God, don't want that to happen. Across the dangerously unstable roof from where you crouch in easily, you can see a pile of construction materials probably left over by contractors working on the roof. 
Among the materials is a first aid kit, but navigating the length of the roof to reach it will be perilous. One wrong step and you could stumble off the roof into a ditch you see below. Near you is a thick vine that you could climb down to reach a courtyard. And not too far from you is a long board someone has laid between the roof and the nearby greenhouse, which seems to be sturdier than the guardhouse. Optional challenge. Get the first aid kit. Um, win. Draw clue six. Then make story choice below. Lose. Raise danger meter by two and go to card 26. So... The type of challenge that what this is going to be right now is going to be a dexterity challenge. Um, I don't have anything that's going to give me a plus to dexterity, and this is going to need to be a three or higher. Um, this one's a little tough. I'm not really too sure if I want to go for the first aid kit um, with everything we already have. But then again, I really don't know how much you're going to be getting damaged and if you will actually get the choice to pick up some healing possibly later on in the game. So far we haven't rolled a one. If you do roll a one, no matter what um, your challenge is, right over here on the side, I did forget to mention this at the beginning, if you roll a one, the challenge loss. So um, one is an instant fail no matter what, no matter how many pluses you have um, or anything like that. I think we're going to give the dexterity thing a shot. Let's go for it. And let's actually see if we can roll a three. I rolled a one instant fail. It had to happen sooner or later. Lose. Raise danger meter by two. So we're going to go up two on the danger meter. So we're still in the three range. Um, and we go to story card 26. So I'm guessing we're probably going to fall back down into something. And they say you're not supposed to pick up the deck, but some, considering I'm upside down here, it's kind of tricky to um, see some of these cards and navigate that deck upside down. So 26, you land in the ditch, splashing into shallow, frigid water. At this point, you notice a large grate ahead of you, which partially blocks the entrance to a dark cement culvert that the water flows into. If you bent over, you could walk under the lower rim of the grate and enter the culvert. You see a small piece of paper drifting by you in the water. You might be able to grab it if you act fast. All right, so let's try to grab this. It's an optional challenge. Grab the paper. Um, it's three. We're going to use our perception plus two. So as long as we don't roll a one again, we should essentially be able to roll a one again and instantly fail. So our binoculars didn't help us any. Maybe this die. Maybe I, I knew I should have replaced the die at, um, before I started. So I raised the danger meter by one. So we are now up to a four. After challenge, make story choice below. Along the side of the ditch is a dusty path leading toward what appears to be an elaborate hedge mage. Hedge maze. So if you enter the culvert, go to story card 28. If you enter the hedge maze, go to story card 12. I think we're going to enter the culvert and we're going to go to story card 28. I think that's one of the bottom cards here on this deck. You creep through the darkness and find the cement walls end as natural stone and earth begin. Let's make sure. Yep, card 28. I want to make sure I grab the right card. Occasional vents to the surface let in just barely enough light to see by. Ahead, you glimpse the warm firelight of torches. You come to a fork in the tunnel, lit by the dancing flames. One tunnel descends deeper and is half filled with water. You could swim through it, but you can't see where the tunnel leads or how far it goes. Another tunnel looks partially caved in. Tiny clumps of earth periodically fall from the ceiling as you approach this tunnel, and several of the supports that hold the walls up have gaping cracks in them. So right now it's kind of showing me a picture of what I'm actually kind of seeing here on the back of this card. If you dive into the water, filled tunnel, I go to story 22. If I explore the partially collapsed tunnel, go to 16. 
I guess let's explore the partially collapsed tunnel. It's probably going to be anything, probably be a dexterity check if anything. So let's go to story card 16. So I think this is kind of interesting the way Z-Man did this. They've basically taken apart the book aspect of the Choose Your Own Adventure books like I kind of showed at the beginning and have just put it into cards, which is kind of interesting. Um, I've had games before that have utilized a six-sided die for challenges, uh, but I do like the board here. It's a little bit more elaborate than just using the pen and paper I used when I was a teenager um, playing through games like this. So here we go. Without warning, the earthen walls begin to collapse around you, and before you can react, you are up to your waist in dirt. You writhe and twist, trying to escape, but it only causes more soil to cascade down. Soon it's up to your shoulders, then your neck, then your cheeks. You struggle to spit the soil out as it fills your mouth, but within moments you are fully buried. You can only see the dark earth in front of your eyes. Your hand closes around a metal disc, perhaps a coin. You'll never know, though, as the soil fills your lungs and the world wavers and goes gray before finally turning black. So there we go. Hey, Brian. Yep. Yep. Like I, sh I don't know if you were here at the beginning, but um, here's one of the early books from when I was a kid. Um, this is the Cave of Time. I believe this is the actually Choose Your Own Adventure. It's actually the one of the first books um, that had come out there. Um, so I just died. So let's see what happens. The end. Um, move back one space on the psychic scale. So we move back one space on the psychic scale and return to the previous card. So I wanted to see, I want to check real quick when you die, if that is the only thing that actually happens. Where was dying? Goals and death, 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 death. If you die, move the psychic meter back the number of spaces and go to the, yep. Okay, that's about it. So then we go back to the previous card. So, we know we do not want to um, explore the partially collapsed um, tunnel, and you can't, whenever you do a card, like what I just did there um, by taking card 16 and um, exploring that tunnel, uh, you can't do that card again. So now we actually have to go to the other direction, which, which is dive into the water, filled tunnel, and go to story card 22. So um, we're going to jump ahead to story card 22 and see what that brings us. So here we go. Mustering all the courage you can, you dive into the watery tunnel. There is just enough room in the tunnel above the water for you to lift your head between strokes and take a breath. Eventually, the tunnel drops lower and lower until it's completely submerged underwater. You hold your breath, dive down, and look around about 30 feet the tunnel opens up to a bigger body of water, a pond or a pool with sunlight beaming into it. You pop up for air. Well, I've come this far, you think. You're ready to chance it. You take a deep breath and dive down. You get 10 feet in, 15 feet in, 25 feet in. Just as you're about to exit the underwater tunnel, something tugs on your leg. Of course, why not? You can't tell if it's an animal or if you're caught in an underwater vine. This is going to be a fight challenge Fight to escape. So we are at a four right now. We're going to use our knife since it is a fight challenge. That's going to give us a plus one. So right now we need to roll a three or higher. And I'm going to re-roll that since it's bounced out, but that was a six. I should have kept it. Uh, that one's cocked, but we're still going to keep the six because it was close enough to not be in cocked. So we win. Draw clue 20. So what's been going on, Brian? I haven't seen you in a little while. I haven't been able to come down to the store. Hopefully next week I'm going to make it down there for some gaming time. Clue 20. The thing, whatever it is, wraps more tightly around your leg. It's pulling you down. Another tendril or tentacle slides around your neck. You pry it off, and with the last of your strength, you give a powerful kick and you're free. Just like that, the thing is gone. You emerge into a swimming pool with a lush pool house next to it. Lower danger meter by two. That is nice. One, two. So we're back into the three range. And we go to story card 23. So this clue gets discarded. We go to story card 23, which I just happened to flip to right there. That was actually, I will not be able to do that again. We will discard our card 22 
and see what happens now. It's obvious that nobody has cleaned the pool in ages. The water is a murky green and surface is littered with leaves and branches. Ripples pulse outward from the center of the pool. Out of nowhere, you hear a commotion. You look around and wonder if it's coming from inside the pool house nearby. Then you see movement on top of a gazebo in the distance. Someone or something is engaged in a struggle up there. Maybe they need your help. Then again, if you offer assistance, you might end up needing your help yourself. So, this should have gone back into our inventory. Um, we have an optional challenge. Investigate the ripples in the pool. It is a um, perception check, which uh, we have the goggles, or our binoculars, I mean. So, why the hell not? We get a plus two to perception checks. Um, as long as we don't roll a one, we're successful. And I got my little tray here, trying to keep it. And I rolled a one again. That is three ones. For another epic fail, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get a new die the next time I play this. Lose. Raise the danger meter by two. One, two. You may try again. This time I'm at a four. Um, let's try again. I can't roll a one twice in a roll, can I? So I need a two this time because we're still going to use the binoculars. And I rolled a four. So we got the six, so we're good. We'll move that back to our inventory. We still have a bottle of water, which we can utilize, which can lower the meter by three, which um, I definitely don't think we're anywhere near needing to do yet. But since we did win, lower the danger meter by two, one, two, so that's fine. And draw clue eight. So let's draw clue eight and see what we get next. You walk down the steps into the water and see what's making the waves a strange, whirring metal sphere slightly bigger than a softball. You impulsively grab it. Mm, not too sure if I would have done that, but hey. The sphere vibrates in your hand. There are two buttons on it. You press one, nothing happens. You press the other button, the sphere continues to vibrate. Instinctively, you press both buttons at the same time. The sphere stops moving and begins to glow. Draw clue 21. So that sounds like Phantasm to me. If anybody's familiar with a 70s or early 80s horror movie, um, go look that one up if you aren't. The, 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 the spherical alien ball that um, will basically make its way into your brain. So we have an item here. Weary, whirring metal sphere. Your psychic sense tells you this is an important item. Keep this card. Move forward three spaces on the psychic scale. One, two, three. So we are up to five. We are almost to level two. Yeah, that's kind of cool. Finish story card 23. So this is going to keep this item. Okay, so we have another item. We're going to set this over here um, with our battery. And after the challenge, I can make a story choice below. If I go to the pool house, I can go to story card 11. Or if I go to the action at the gazebo, go to story card 9. Oh, I need a drink for this one. So, do I want to see what the commotion is about? Or do I just move along my merry way? We're trying everything that we probably shouldn't this time. So let's see what the commotion is at and go to story card nine. What the hell? I have a feeling it's going to be that creature. But you know what? We won't know until we look. You sprint to the gazebo, practically pushed along by the winds that are picking up a light sprinkling of rain spatters on the ground as you run. You make it to the shelter of the structure and mayhem occurring above you on the roof increases in intensity. Who is up there and what are they doing, you wonder? You notice a driveway about 20 feet away. Premonition, if you are level 2 or higher on the psychic scale, draw clue 27. I am one away. If I wouldn't have lost that one due to death, I would have been at level 2 and I would have gotten clue 27. So we know we're missing clue 27 now and that's part of the game. So if we climb into the top of the gazebo, or if we run to the driveway, we've come this far. We need to go to the top of the gazebo now and go to card 10, because why the Sam hell not? So 
So let's go to card 10. You stand on the gazebo's railing, steadying yourself by gripping an ornate post holding up the roof. The rumbling above sounds and feels frightening. What are you getting yourself into? Reluctant to barge into the middle of this situation, you raise yourself just enough for a peek and discover that there is no one on the gazebo roof. The commotion is actually a large satellite dish broken into three pieces. The big jagged fragments are still connected to the base by wires and the violent winds are spinning them in a circle with great force. Oh, lovely. Flailing widely like an angry octopus, the satellite dish almost hits you in the face. You might be able to grab a piece zooming by. So this is a required challenge and this is a climbing challenge right now. Attempt to grab a piece of the satellite dish. We are in the three area. We have nothing that actually helps us with a climb, so we need a three or higher. And we roll another one. As the ever going story for me goes, dice hate me. I think that is four or five ones now, and I probably haven't even rolled 10 times. Don't even know if that's statistically possible, but for me it is. Lose, draw, clue, 17. So let's hope I don't end up with a cutoff hand here, um, but um, we'll see what happens. Your fingertips graze a piece of the satellite dish, but you can't quite grab it. You reach too far, lose your balance, tumble from the gazebo and down a short hill. Your confusion from the fall slowly subsides and you hear the sound of a beautiful violin nearby. You stumble off in the direction of the music. Raise danger meter by two. One, two. Go to story card 17. Discard those and see what story card 17 brings us. I think I need to quit making so many silly decisions to go see some of these things that you probably wouldn't want to go see if you were in the type of situation that you're actually in right now. You move further and further toward the hypnotic sound of the distant violin, which is oddly calm and uplifting. Even as the winds increase around you, you notice there is a driveway up in the distance, but before you get there, you arrive at a horse stable with an open gate. Inside, sitting on a stool, is the source of the violin music, a chimpanzee playing his heart out, a soulful expression on his face. The chimp is fully committed to the music. You have never heard such an emotional performance. It's, it's beautiful. And they show a picture of the chimpanzee playing the violin. If you leave the stable and run to the driveway, go to story career 30. If you tiptoe through the gate to experience the full power of the performance, go to 24. We've made every wrong decision so far. So you know, card 24 it is because I just have to see what is going on with a chimp playing a violin. You tiptoe through the open gate, eager to hear the finale of the chimp's violin piece, quietly, quietly. With your third step, you trigger a motion sensor light that completely illuminates the interior of the building. Apparently, this is no stable. It's a kennel. 20 Doberman Pinchers were peacefully enjoying the concert, but now they glare at you with anger in their eyes. The chimp frowns and slowly points his violin bow towards you. The Dor Dobermans respond and rush to attack you and then eat you alive. The last thing you see is the chimpanzee violinist laughing at your fate. So embarrassing. The end. Move back one space. Don't make these decisions, people. Psychic scale and return to story card 17. So, we knew we shouldn't have gone in there, but we had to see what happened. We're going to go to story card 30 and um, basically leave the stable and run to the driveway, which I knew I should have done anyway. So that is story card 30. We're definitely making our way. You appear in the driveway. Chapter one, goal achieved. Wow, we only went through about Half of the deck. I thought I did a lot of exploring too. You appear in the driveway, which leads you 
to the mansion's entrance. On the door is a plaque that reads, Marsden, and a large crystal door knocker, which seems newer than everything else on the front of the building. You knock loudly, many times, but there is no answer. The storm is really picking up now. You try the doorknob and are surprised to find that the door is unlocked. You've been lucky enough so far, but you wonder if you've missed something. Before you enter the house, you look back. You can see a few clear paths. One leads towards one leads toward a statuary, another to a small cemetery. Two more paths stretch out toward a watery ditch with a gate and the house's luxurious pool. You could go back to explore it if you want. Story return. There are items in this chapter that will be useful later in the story. You can take a risk and go back for any you missed by following the choices below. If you head to this statuary, raise danger meter by two and go to story card four. If you head to the cemetery, raise danger meter two and go to story card 21. If you head to the ditch, we've already been there and we've been to the pool. So we can go to the statuary or the cemetery. I'm thinking, let's skip the cemetery because that just sounds like someplace we don't want to go. But the statuary um, actually might not be that bad to go to. Let's raise it by two. and go to story card four. Let's make sure we did this right. Yep, go to story card four. So I'm gonna leave this card out just because that's kind of like the end of the chapter, I think. The horseman is a dashing, bearded Civil War soldier, his bronze face stoic. He holds out a cavalry saber toward the brooding sky. The sword's edge glints in the weak sunlight that penetrates the thickening clouds above. The sword looks almost new. At the base of the statue is a plaque that proclaims that as a memorial to Henry Marsden, the plaque reads, Henry Marsden, born 1839, died 1887, general in the Union Army, during the Civil War, severely wounded at the Battle of Shiloh of 1862, appointed a warden of Hedgebrook Prison in 1880. We had already read that. To your left is the entrance to a hedge maze. To your right is a graying picket fence with a rickety wooden gate. You can see two stone angel statues and beyond them a cemetery. Optional challenge, search the monument base. Optional challenge, climb the statue to examine the saber. So, let's examine the base, because that is a perception challenge, so we're going to get a plus two on that one. So even though we're at a four, we only need a two. I rolled a five that time, so we're good there. So that can go back here. Um, draw clue 18 in regards for that. Bonus story choice. B -b -b Bonus story choice. When you inadvertently press a hidden switch, the statue slides to one side, revealing a cement passage. Place the new story choice below at the bottom of story card four. This option may be considered when you are ready to make your story choice. So I'm guessing this just basically goes down here like this. So um, I do kind of want to do this climb challenge, but I am extremely afraid to try to climb this damn thing now because I rolled a five and I've already rolled five ones. Um, but I think we're going to give it a go. I mean, I could use my bottle of water to lower it by three, but... Um, that would give me a little bit more of a chance. <sighs> Boy. Boy, decisions, decisions. I think we're going to use the water bottle. Discard any time to lower the danger meter by three. One, two, three. 
So we're back into the three range. So now we need a three or higher and I rolled a three. That was a good call to make. So that was successful. Draw clue two. Cavalry saber. Cavalry saber. The saber comes loose in your hand. It's heavy and quite sharp. Your psychic sense tells you this is an important item. Keep this item, move forward two spaces on the psychic scale. So we are now into level two. So now I wish we would have um, been to that other choice that let us do that. Keep this, move, move, move two spaces on the psychic scale, finish story card four. So we're going to throw this into our inventory. We definitely don't want to get this confused. We will probably just place this over um, the the starting pocket knife that we have. You can only use one challenge booster at a time. So even though I have two that have the fighting icon on them, um, I can only use one when I'm doing a fight. So there, there's really no reason to utilize the pocket knife anymore because the pocket knife is plus one, the cal cavalry saber, saber is plus two. Um, so we're definitely going to use that. So our choices now are enter the hedge mage, story 12. Cemetery 21, or if you want to see where the hidden passage leads, go to 28. Um, do we already do card 28? We already did card 28. So we did that so that somehow in a roundabout way we already did that. I really don't want to enter the hedge mage and the cemetery I'm really nervous about, but let's try the cemetery. The hedge maze, I'm guessing you might get lost in, but the cemetery, let's see what happens. We have a saber with us now, so maybe we will be able to um, actually fight anything if we run into anything. Passing between a pair of stone angels, so I guess all of these should probably get to be discarded. That's going to include, going to be discarded. We are done with story card four. That's going to go over there into the discard pile. And passing between a pair of stone angels, you enter an old family cemetery. There is a marble mausoleum in the center of the cemetery. A short set of stairs leads into the shadow interior, into its shadowy interior. Next to where you stand, a freshly dug grave yawns in the pale sunlight. It's unsettling to think of climbing into it, but you see something shiny embedded in the dirt walls. If you enter the mausoleum, go to story card five. If you climb into the open grave, go to 16. Let's go into the mausoleum for story card five because going into the dirt, that's just going to collapse on us. Hopefully the mausoleum door doesn't shut on us. The mausoleum interior feels musty and cool. Something is dripping from the ceiling and landing in the corner with a plink, which is odd. Given that it hasn't started raining yet, you also notice the mausoleum is bigger on the inside than the outside suggested. A stone sarcophagus lies before you in the center of the chamber with the word Marsden carved into it. It appears that others have been in the mausoleum recently. There's a freshly dug pit to the side of the sarcophagus and an elaborate tunnel has been dug into the ground besides the nearby wall. You can see that the tunnel is lined with cement. Optional challenge, search around the sarcophagus or optional challenge, remove the stone lid of the sarcophagus. I'm guessing people have already been inside the sarcophagus, so I don't know if we're going to do the strength challenge. Let's do the first one and search around the sarcophagus. It is a perception, so we do have plus two, so as long as we don't roll that one, we are successful. So that's going to give us clue 23. Let me clean up my clue cards here a little bit and make that stack a little neater. I'm going to jump ahead to clue 23. You find a large wooden dowel. Your psychic sense tells you this is something important. Keep this item. Move forward one space on the psychic scale. Yes. Finish story card five. So this is another inventory item. We will just set this over here next to our battery and binoculars and our whirling sphere. That actually gives us a strength bonus. So now it would probably be a time to do this strength challenge. Why the hell not? And let's open the sarcophagus and see what the heck happens. We're going to get a plus 
two with the doll. And we roll the one, so we're an instant fail. Yes. Raise the danger meter by two. One, two. So, what are our choices now? Climb into the pit. Go to story card 16. Travel through the tunnel. 28. I thought I already did 28, so I can't do 28 again. We can't do 28 again, so we're going to do 16. We've already done 16. So now what the heck happens if you've already done those? I need to refer to the book real quick. Otherwise, you may advance to chapter two. Story returns. Cards you have already seen, cards that have been discarded and cannot be added to your inventory again and cannot lower the danger meter or... Oh, okay. You must make it back to the story card with your chapter goal in order to continue to the next, next chapter. All right, so I guess I would just grab one of these cards from, I guess, my discard pile. I guess let's do 28. No, let's not do 28. Let's do 16. Because 28 was messed up. Where is 16? There's 16. All right, well, I don't want to do 16 because 16 was the damn pit. So I guess we got to do 28. Hmm, that's kind of screwy the way they have this return thing going on. I'm going to have to look this up and see actually how that's supposed to work. Because it basically says, cards you have already seen, cards that have been discarded and in your inventory cannot be added to your inventory again and cannot lower the danger meter or move you forward on the psychic scale. Keep listening to the story, special story returns, let you go back in a current chapter to pursue alternate experiences. This might result in different but every choice you make comes with a risk. You might climb up the danger meter or fall down the psychic scale. If you choose to go back in the story, two rules apply. So I'm guessing you just re-experience these, but they can't basically adjust um, your psychic scale. So, um, so we're going to go through the tunnel. Through the tunnel is going to take us to the water-filled tunnel, which we got to dive into, which is 22. So we're kind of just kind of looping back around, it seems. And I think we got to get back to this card here. So we got to do another fight. But if this, if you already experienced this card, that definitely going to have to look this one up maybe on Board Game Geek. We're going to do a fight. So we're going to get a plus two. So as long as we don't roll a one, we got two, four. We beat that thing. Draw clue 20. I think we beat that thing before, so clue 20 is out already. Yep, it is. So I, I can't lower the danger, I'm guessing. Cards you've already seen cannot be added to inventory, cannot lower the, yep, okay, so I would, when I experienced this the first time, I lowered the danger by two, which I can't now. So I kind of see how this is working. Go to story card 23. So we're jumping ahead to 23. And we're back by the pool. So our choices are, can go to pool house or go to the gazebo. We'll go to story card 11, which is the pool house. I don't know if we actually went there the last time. So let's discard all of these and actually see if we've been to 11. Oh, hi, Kimmy. All right, 11. So here's something new that we didn't get to do. Uh, you can tell that the pool house was once quite luxurious. It contains half a dozen private rooms with showers, 
Um, just stopped in to say a quick hi. Got to go. All right. Have fun at work. See you later. <laughs> um, you can tell that the pool house was once quite luxurious. It contains half a dozen private rooms with showers, as well as an ornate ma mahogany bar in the common area. It must have been fun to hang out in this place in its glory days. Those thoughts fade as the sounds of a disturbance erupt from the top of a gazebo in the distance. And now you can hear a lone violin playing a soothing melody. If you investigate the gazebo, go to story card nine. If you follow the sound, we want to investigate the gazebo. Skip the violin. We've already been there. So we want to go to story card nine. Oh, and I think we've already been to story card nine. So where's story card nine? We gotta find nine. You go to the gazebo. You wonder who's up there. If you are a level two or higher, draw clue 27. We are level two now, but considering this is our second pass through, card you have already seen. This was a card we had already seen, so I can't take clue 27, and oh, do I wish I would have. Climb to the top of the zebo. Nope, let's run to the driveway, go to card 30. That takes us back to the end of the chapter, which I think we're going to stop there. I don't think we're going to try to loop back around through anything. Um, but we are ready to go to chapter 2 now. Um, I get to advance um, to chapter 2. I get to keep all my inventory items. So everything I have inventory-wise, I'm going to get to keep. I did use my water bottle already. Um, so I can't lower my um, danger meter anymore because I had already lowered it. But that is the end of Chapter 1. So there's five chapters in this first box, um, House of Danger. And it basically is just the way this kind of is is everything, each each of the five chapters is just kind of their own deck of cards. Um, so when I get this chapter ready, I'm going to take the House of Danger card, put it here, and uh, just go through chapter two. And then repeat, rinse, and repeat. There are also different uh, clue decks for the different chapters. So here's the clue deck for chapter two, three, four, and five. So there's clue decks as well in here. Um, but that is basically the gist of a choose your own adventure style game. So the last thing I had kind of streamed solo was uh, Seventh Continent, which again is similar and akin to this whole choose your own adventure thing. Um, these choose your own adventure books that I had, you know, mentioned at the beginning of the of the stream are kind of like the early. Um, predecessors to a lot of this stuff. Um, these Choose Your Own Adventure books were probably out and you were playing through the, these probably before some of the early computer games that like you used to play, um, like I used to play back on my Commodore 64, like Zork. Um, some of the ones I had on my Texas Instruments, they were a lot of Choose Your Own Adventure. I think some of those used what was referred to as kind of like a scum type engine. Um, they had a certain type of vocabulary that you utilized as you were playing through the game, you would type like go north or some some games let you do like an abbreviation, like just do N, E, W, S for the different directions you would want to move. Um, you would then have to type in different um, possible verbs and nouns to interact with different things uh, and try to just choose your own adventure. It was kind of like a story that you were trying to unravel and play through, but you had to try to figure out um, with those games, you had to try to figure out what type of words to use. Um, to be able to decipher everything and figure figure everything out. These are a little different because you're pretty much just reading through a book, but it's a little bit more than that because you're getting to decide where you go in the story. So as you saw as we were playing through this whole thing, there's a lot of different choices that we made. We died twice, um, which is kind of stinky. But um, I, I think that, 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 that that's just part of the game. It's... It's the decisions that you make. And sometimes, you know, you're thinking, you know, do I really want to do this? You know, like I was thinking some of those times, let's just see what happens. I know this is probably going to be bad, but um, for the stream's sake, let's just see if we die. And, you, you know, we did. Um, 
like I said, there was one uh, choose your own adventure style game that I had that utilized a six sided die as well. I don't believe this book does. This book is literally just a um, choose your own adventure like this one. This this book is literally just like House of Danger, but in a book form. Whereas this is cards. Um, but the one the one I had was almost like a mini role playing game back in the day, and I and I think it's somewhere at my parents' house, probably somewhere in their basement, um, where a lot of my games still are. And that one actually, you had health that you needed to keep track of, and um, different types of inventory weapons and stuff like that. They gave you bonuses to. Um, attacks kind of like what your inventory is here and like i said you needed to utilize a six-sided die as well uh and depending on how you rolled it would take you to different pages and everything so um i think z-man games has something kind of interesting here it's it's definitely bringing back a lot of nostalgia for those of us who have played through you know these books back in the day and i'm sure there's a lot of people um, who have read through these books um, both younger and older um, that have gone through these and I think this is pretty cool. Now, this can be played um, for one or more players. Uh, and I think when you play with more players, what's going to happen is you're pretty much just going to be um, having different people read um, some of the different things and decide what kind of happens. I'm going to take another drink because I've been doing a lot of reading and talking during this episode. But... Um, I think it works out pretty good. I think some of the items that you get are very interesting. Um, they definitely help out when you are um, doing some of the different challenges. Uh, I kind of like this psychic scale, which is kind of like a level up meter in letting you um, feel a little stronger as you're kind of going through the game actually. And if you reach different levels, Going through the clues, you possibly can obtain, you know, some special rewards for for doing that. But um, this is kind of cool. I've been seeing a lot of people posting this in some of the different Facebook groups. So I was a little hesitant about maybe doing a run through of this. But I figure let's run through the first chapter. Let's actually show it to people who might not be familiar with this style of game, with this genre of game. Considering you probably haven't seen some of these choose your own adventure style games in, you know, quite a while. Um, or at least I haven't, I know. But that is um, The House of Danger um, from Z-Man Games. It's a small box. Um, you can pick them up at your friendly local game store. Um, I believe it was released uh, this past week. Um, other than that, we should be back on Sunday with a stream. I don't know if we're going to be doing a stream early Sunday or later on in the evening. We will have to see what's going on on Sunday. I know Sundays we've been a little busy sometimes during the day, so we're doing the stream at night. Uh, next week I will be back with um, another solo game. I don't know if I'm going to play through Chapter 2 or if I'm actually going to start doing my solo playthrough idea where I play through a game um, multiple times. There's a couple of games that I kind of want to do solo with, and I think one of the games I may give a shot to is Hoplomachus, Rise of Rome um, from Chip Theory Games. I've heard that that is a very good um, solo style game. And um, they were nice enough to give us a review copy at Origins um, last month. So I think I kind of want to dig into that and maybe start playing that next week. I don't know if I want to go through all of the adventures of this and spoil everything. I figure playing through the first chapter would give people enough of... Um, an understanding of what the game is and whether they'd like to tackle this or not. You know, if you've watched all of this, I still have a good, you know, quite a few cards here that I didn't explore. There's still quite a few clues here that I didn't obtain. Um, so I didn't spoil everything in this first chapter and you still have four chapters in this box to go. So you still have quite a bit of, you know, time that you can invest and play in this game. Um, I haven't really heard if they're going to be making um, many more of these, if there's going to be a series of these coming out. I'm going to have to maybe check Boarding and Week and actually see into that. But um, so far, I think this is kind of cool. And I know I'm going to be definitely playing through the rest of this. Um, I know Kim wanted to kind of play through this, even though um, 
I didn't, I don't know if she would have enjoyed this one as much, but I know she was kind of wanted to actually see what this is like, but, um, maybe she could just sit down and watch the video. Maybe she could play through chapter two with me. But, um, other than that, everybody, we're going to call it a night. Um, thank you for everybody that stopped on by and said, hi, um, don't forget to follow us on Twitch, twitch.tv slash what I'm playing now. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash what I'm playing now. You can like us on Facebook, facebook.com, just do a search for what I'm playing now. You can follow us Twitter and Instagram at what I'm playing now. Don't forget to drop the G. I have a couple of more interviews coming up. I have an interview with Mark from Grand Gamers Guild coming up. Um, we're going to be recording that one a little early and then posting that one later as we get closer to their Kickstarter that they just had to push back a little bit. Uh, I have an, another interview um, set up. I believe I'll be interviewing Steve Jackson from Steve Jackson Games here, possibly in the next week or so. Um, I was email. I've been emailing with them, um, so we have some correspondence going with them as well. I also have John Longren coming in um, next week um, for an interview. So uh, the podcast, if you're interested in hearing uh, me talking to some different designers, publishers, um, last week we talked to Chandler from Crowdox. So we've been doing a lot of interviews, and I'm trying to line up a lot of interviews for upcoming episodes. So. Uh, if you're looking for uh, to hear some different designers and things going on, check out the podcast, What I'm Playing Now. Other than that, everybody, we'll be back on Sunday probably. Um, I don't know if I'll be doing a stream other than before then. Um, but other than that, you know what to do. Like I say in the podcast, go play some games and let me know what you're playing now. But until then, everybody, you have a great time gaming, and we'll see you later. Thanks for joining me. Bye-bye.